We are creating a platform for those who are curious, one that tells the story from the artist's perspective. Moments in time captured from the innovators who are reshaping dance, music, theater, and the visual arts. This is the Working Artist Project. With pride for dignity. It's an interesting thing to think about with pride for dignity. And it ties back into the black American experience. It ties into legacy. It ties into creativity, confidence. It is a reflection of who Henry is and how he creates his art and what he would like to express to you, the people. Henry Conaway is a drummer, a writer, a human being that is in touch with the delicacies of communication. And he made it clear that his message is subtle, but poignant, and that you are sure to listen and feel the energy that he's putting out. So today is a special day because we get a chance to dive deep into the psyche of Mr. Carnaway, hear his voice, hear his music, and to feel his vibrations. I know you guys are going to enjoy this episode of the Working Artist Project. So sit back, relax, and take a listen. I want to welcome the one and only Henry Conaway to the Working Artist Project. What's up, brother? What's popping? You so, got it. Henry, uh, y'all heard it already. I gave y'all a, a little nice little introduction of what it is <laughs> and what it ain't. I like to start off by getting uh, an idea of who you are, where you come from, and why you create. That's a deep question. <laughs> First question, <laughs> man. Uh, I'm a son. I'm a brother. I am a drummer, a musician. I'm a lot of things, man. I am uh, a deep cat, I think. I'd like to think anyway. Um, a student, definitely a student. So I was born in Detroit, um, grew up there, stayed there until uh, till I graduated high school, and then I left for college. I attended uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, and stayed there for uh, a period of time and moved to New York about three years ago. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Now you're famous. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if famous is, is the right word. Rich and famous. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to claim that eventually, oh, I guess. There it is. There it is. <laughs> so, man, I do. So, like you said, you're from Detroit, mm-hmm. moved to Atlanta, went to school there. After school, you stayed there for a bit. You had some musical experiences. Mm-hmm. Then you made your way to New York City. Yes. So, I, I want to just go back in time okay. and go to the beginning. Why the drums and how? As you may know, uh, you don't select the instrument that you play. The instrument that you play selects you. At least that's my uh, that's my philosophy. Um, so I was called to the drums. I was drawn to the drums, if you will. When I was young and at the house, I'd be in the kitchen taking stuff out the cabinets and you know turning over the pots and mm-hmm. turning over the pans and making drum sets on the floor. Um, my mother had some shoe racks. And I'd take the shoe boxes, and I think I put like a coat hanger through a shoe box and put a symbol on it, like a toy symbol from one of those drum sets that I played through, you know, busted it all up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the only thing we had left was like that symbol. I think it had a couple sizzles in it too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I took some trash cans and turned them over, and then the next door neighbor gave me a bass drum. So there's a bass drum and shoe racks with two trash cans for times. And my uncle gave me a snare drum, so we got that no hi hat. You know, and a toy, uh, toy symbol, and my godfather gave me a bass drum pedal, and you know, I just started building any way I could, building a okay. drum set. Okay. Um, I began taking piano lessons as a very young man, and we'd go to the, to the, to the place where the lessons were taking place, and they'd have a little shop there, and um, you know, I'd ask every week, "Hey, mom, can I get some out of the shop? Well, what do you want, son?" Well, can I have these drumsticks? No, well, no, son, we're not doing that, you know, for years, it seemed. Um, but I was just, I was drawn to it for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. That was great, man. You know, every, I guess you're right, you know, in the black community, we say, uh, we were called. 
<laughs> you know, start with the preachers. I was called to preach. <laughs> in so much in the same way, you you know, I, I think everyone's called to do something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whether that be sweeping the floor, taking out the trash, or being a lawyer, being a president. Mm-hmm. So you were lucky to find your calling and for your community or your family around you to provide you the tools to explore that. Mm-hmm. Now, what you didn't say is that your father, he he's a violinist. He did play violin okay. uh, when he was in middle school, high school. Mm-hmm. Um, he stopped just, you know, pressures of that time and being black, really. Mm-hmm. Um, he's six five, and so he was encouraged to play ball. Um, he ended up going to going to college and studying in the medical field. Um, but yeah, he was not. You know, he was he was discouraged from playing. Mm. Uh, and from what I've gathered, hearing him play or hearing people talk about him playing, he was excellent. Um, he shares with me the way that he experiences music which is a lot like I do. He was not necessarily a strong sight reader. He was a person who just heard, and he played classical stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, he he would just hear it. Right, right. You know, he would hear a phrase and know where it was supposed to go. Um, That's something that I believe that I've inherited. Um, You know, when I was playing the piano, it was, I'd hear something one time and have it. Right, 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 right. You know, uh, as I'm getting into complex music now, it's, it's not quite that way anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he was very gifted. My mother played the flute. My sister plays uh, woodwind instruments. Everybody in the house plays at least a little bit of piano. Okay. Uh, my grandmother played piano in church. and You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know the, your, your standard. The standard. <laughs> just, standard. The, the standard. standard. Yeah, you're right, just standard. Right. That's where everybody I know comes from for the most part. Yeah, it, in our community, you know, in the black community, bro, like you learn to play music first at church mm-hmm. and because that's where you hear music the most. That's where you spend a lot of time. You know, I know me growing up, man, I was in church probably five days a week, mm-hmm. you know, just because it was one way to keep us out of the other stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, mm-hmm. so but I, I'll, I'll talk about the church thing, man. I didn't actually learn how to play in church. Mm. I went to a uh, United Church of Christ and... We did not have drums at the church, mm-hmm. probably until I started playing drums. But it was not me that was playing the drums in the church. It was they hired they hired a a jazz drum a jazz drummer to okay. play um to play at the church, and that was an interesting dynamic. So I didn't necessarily grow up under like a church cat, as okay. you know, as okay. we would talk about it. Right. I didn't began necessarily playing gospel but what i did learn to do is to hone my own sense of musicality you know if the drummer would be out on a smoke break that took too long and the choir director was ready to start you know i'd be there and they'd say well come on henry you're here yeah and so i learned how to follow uh you know how to follow direction and how to just be intuitive really behind the drums and that's something that i'd like to think has stayed with me you know something i just thought about because you know it's not very it's not that apparent to you until you get into a situation that is outside of your quote unquote comfort zone is one thing that you do learn from being just being in church is how to harness energy mm-hmm. you know and we call that the holy ghost but other people on the scene is just like maybe you're in the quote unquote moment mm-hmm. but it's just harnessing the energy of the current situation mm-hmm. and it's it's imperative to the environment in church for everyone to do that who is performing or conducting the service and some musicians like you get right in there from the drums you like okay this needs to be at this level and this emotional intensity Mm -hmm. and you practice that from you You learn a lot about being present right Uh, and that's something that especially as a jazz musician who is based in improvisation um, we have to learn and understand how to do Mm -hmm. you know not like you you know, turn on your metronome vibe and kind of, okay, we're locked in. I'm in the pocket. I can kind of zone out, <laughs> right, you know, right, but right. it's okay. What's happening moment to moment where the other members of the band and not saying that cats that play pocket do that. Right. No, for sure. Um, but there's a, there's a thing about being in the moment that's, that's very important to us doing our jobs. Right. And I say us, cause you all may not know that Darian as well as a drummer. So we kind of talk, we kind of talk and shop today. <laughs> yeah, man. So, you know, in Detroit, it seems, uh, well, I know for a fact that you guys have like a strong infrastructure mm-hmm. 
in place for young students um, who want to learn to play music. And you seem to be a part of that infrastructure that was happening at that time. And I have I know other people who were also like India Owens, uh, Lawrence Leathers. And can you just talk about some of those things and those programs that you were involved in and the people who helped you nurture your talent? Detroit is super strong as far as the tradition of handing the tradition down. Um, there is an aural component of the art that we are a part of. And so my learning began very early. My first piano teacher uh, was my aunt, my, my, my uncle's wife. Uh, who lived around the corner and she'd come over to the house or I'd go over to the house and we'd deal with that. And I had a cousin who lived out in L.A. who would come. And so we'd sit at the piano and we'd, you know, he'd teach me stuff. I'd teach him stuff. Um, <clears throat> then I moved into to middle school where I began playing. I was in sixth grade. I began playing the drums. Um, and then I moved to high school with, uh, so David Berry was my middle school teacher and Excellent guy. He, There's a story that goes along with that. We'll come back to that later. Um, then I studied with Willie McAllister, and he had a brother who played drums, so I'd go and study with his brother privately at his house. And George Davidson and George Goldsmith, who gave me my first drum lesson and gave me my first uh, Gladstone pad. Uh, and then we moved to our after-school program, which was led by Marcus Belgrave. Uh, and that's the one that India was a part of. and. Mm -hmm. Nate Wynn and Chris Johnson and uh, John Dixon. And I mean, there's a long list of people who are still currently playing. Chris Johnson, who I just mentioned, did a lot of the arrangements on the new Count Basie uh, big band record that's mm -hmm. just out. So, yeah, man, I mean, there's there's a strong sense of community. And Marcus was, you know, beautiful in that he took really a lot of time. Noah Jackson oh, yeah, is yeah, another yeah, one no, of his right. students. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. He took a lot of time to speak with us individually. Uh, and then he took a lot of time and care to make sure that we had access to people in places outside of Detroit. So the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra would often come in to our rehearsals and we met okay. the cats, okay. you know, yeah. when we were in high school. Yeah. Um, and they came down to the school. I know Carl Allen came. Uh, to my school and Delphio came to the school uh, and so there was that there was that access you know even not being in New York we had access to New York and these are relationships that I'm calling on now and people that I'm you know dealing with now Brantford was was around and uh, you know Noah's in Brantford's band now like it's right, a right, right, right. it's something that happened and you don't really understand it until you kind of look outside, you know, look from outside and say, oh, oh, wow, this didn't just happen overnight. I'm not just, <laughs> oh, bam, I moved to New York and I'm all of a sudden connected. No, I got connected before I even went to Atlanta. Right, of course. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. unbeknownst to me, I didn't even know, right, I didn't right, right, even right. understand that Marcus was a part of the first Jazz and Lincoln Center Orchestra. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that for a long time. You know, here I am dealing with the cats and Harlan Riley's in, in, you know, in our rehearsal, and it's okay, okay, well, um, thank you. Right. You know, <laughs> Marion Felder is another cat that came right. out of there. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but now it's, you know, it's making sense. It's dope. Mm -hmm. But we had access to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's important. I, I want to talk about access mm -hmm. because uh, the climate of education in America has changed, or maybe it hasn't changed. It's just become more exacerbated, maybe, even, especially in music education or what some people like to call jazz, what we like to call black American music. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be that most people in the lower classes of America um, don't have access mm -hmm. because there's a, there's a barrier there. There's like, like you said, for those people, types of people to come to schools in 2018, there's a certain fee that has to be paid mm -hmm. and the schools, public schools and stuff like that don't have the money to bring those people in. A lot of, a lot of educators would like to, but they can't afford it. So what do you think about that? And are you doing some things to try to combat that? Or are you even in the education uh, realm at all? I am. Um, I've been a mentor at different points. Uh, I've spent some time with my mentor, um, Jarrell Flynn, who has an organization in Atlanta called How Big Is Your Dream? I've taught uh, private students and 
I've not done a whole lot of institutional uh, education. That's not necessarily my bag. Um, but I'm interested in making sure that people have access. Um, so one of the things that I'm doing now is as a part of the uh, local 802 um one of the things I'm doing now is, as a part of the local 802 Musicians Union, I'm hosting a jam session that is available and free uh, for students to come out. And so right. it's a part of their jazz mentor series where we have different special guests. It's an idea that was brought about by uh, Rebecca Patterson. Okay. And so we're we're just creating a climate where students can come and learn about the tra- the tradition properly. Um, and just, you know, being in an environment where they can play and it's not stressful, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, where they can get some one on one guidance and we can have discussion about, you know, what's going on on the bandstand, what happened, what etiquette things need to be addressed, what kind of musical ideas, you know, we're dealing with and talking about. Uh, so it's free and it's open for any student of, of any ability. Nice. Now, when is that? When is that? Happen? The next one is taking place on Tuesday, September 25th. OK. Uh, and there will be some, I think, every other month okay. uh, taking place down at the local 802. So you can follow me and, you know, all my social media stuff, or you okay. can follow lo- the local 802. Uh, but it's, you know, pretty accessible. Okay. So I want to switch gears here. And, you know, the reason you're here today is because you got a brand new record out. It's your first record. Hey, man. You know, it's a lot of, a lot of love, sweat, and tears and all that <laughs> <laughs> to make this thing was a long time coming. And it's called With Pride for dignity Mm -hmm. like what what does that even mean man that's a it's a really deep title um it's a really deep title that speaks to the experience of africans in america it speaks to all of the hardship that we deal with that we know about or the stuff that we might not know about the stress that we deal with And how to deal with it and walk through it. Keep your head up. Mm. You know, how you can continually be assaulted uh, as a part of this community. How you can continue to walk around and not necessarily feel like you have a home. Mm. I mean, you know, you and I are blessed to have houses and places that we come to and can call our own. And You know, many people have it, but there are a lot that don't. but we're often reminded that we don't really belong here. Mm. And so how do you navigate that and continue Mm -hmm. to be proud, to continue to walk with grace, to continue to call on your ancestors and to continue to, to be a part of the strong legacy of Kings and Queens from which we come. Wow. That's heavy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it is, man. And then how do you say all of that without saying all of that? Right, right. Well, you know what I mean? How do you put put that into yeah. you know, a concise little neat box? No, nah, man. You just got to write a Corey Wallace title. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not going to do it. <laughs> With the pride for dignity okay. for those who... <laughs> such and such and much love to my brother, Corey. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, why don't we take a listen right now to one of the tunes off the record, and this one is Carvin's Agreement. Okay. So Carvin's Agreement, man. Yeah, that, this is a dope song. And, and I'm wondering, what was your inspiration for this? So it's uh, quite a literal title. Um, Michael Carvin, who is master drummer mm-hmm. uh, and the person who I'm currently studying with, uh, was the producer on this album. Oh, okay, cool. And so we've had many, many hours of discussions 
And one of the things that's come up in our discussion is the place of the drums in the pantheon of music and musicians, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is our goal to make sure that the drums hold a place of respect. Um, second to the voice, that's the original instrument. That's the first instrument outside of the human body mm -hmm. uh, that was created. But when we listen to it, very rarely do we listen to it as a solo instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll listen to solo piano for hours and hours and hours, and we'll listen to solo cello and solo saxophone, you know, any other instrument we'll listen to. But for some reason, we have not been conditioned to listen to the drums in the same manner. And so Mr. Carvin said to me, um, I will agree to produce your record if you will agree to play an unaccompanied drum solo. And so I said, fine, sure, I'll do it. You know, he's done it. Um, and so that's something that, I would encourage you as well to do, Mr. Douglas, when you release your, <laughs> your upcoming record, um, because it's important. You know, yeah. it's important for the instrument. Right, right. On my last record, this one doesn't have one, but the last one did mm -hmm. have one. But, you know, a little short, a little ditty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, I mean, why, you know, why shouldn't they listen to a drum solo for, right. you know. Well, people love Max, drum solo. Max Roach did it. Well, some do and some don't. They all love it. They all love it. That's how I feel. <laughs> okay I could be wrong But you know Hey man This is your show Look, Right right It's my show I make the rules <laughs> Yeah this is dope Like what What were some of the The challenges That you had to overcome In order to Just to get to The point that you are Today at making Your own record You're touring the world You know You finished school You did all the, These amazing things What are some What are some of the Biggest challenges You had to overcome In order to get to this point I think a lot of it comes down to mindset. I don't see myself as necessarily facing challenge. There's some, something seems interesting about that, like when you put it that way. You know what I'm saying? Like I made a decision that I was going to move from Atlanta to New York. I made a decision that I was going to make it. You do what you got to do to get there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not like, well, this is hard. Yeah, it's hard. Did you expect it was going to be easy? Is it a challenge? After I made the decision, I packed up my house and put all my stuff in a, in a rental truck, put my car on the trailer in the back, and drove it with my sister, my little sister, uh, to Detroit. Dropped it off at her place. Packed a suitcase and a cymbal bag and a backpack and bought a one-way ticket from Detroit to New York. Mm -hmm. um, there's an older gentleman, friend of mine, that said, hey, Henry, just come. But I don't have a place to live, et cetera, et cetera. Don't worry about it. Just come. You can stay on the couch. Just come. So about a week out, um, I called him. Hey, man, I got my ticket. I'm booked. I'm, I'll be there in a week. Cool. I'm at the airport. Hey, man, I'm at the airport leaving Detroit. I'll be there soon. I get off the plane. Oh, yeah, man, you can't stay with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You yeah. know, I had my little money saved. Right. I'm like, well, this was supposed to be for rent, but if I got to get a hotel. I do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do. Um, so another dear friend of mine called me. Um, we had kind of, my ex-girlfriend, we had kind of been on the on the ins and outs, and we were at this point on the out. Okay. And she said, Henry, you need a place to stay, don't you? I was like, man, I don't, I don't want to say yes to this woman, but yes, I do. Uh, so I went to her place, and she put me on the couch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I stayed on her couch for three days. Um, the third day, I had a gig. The fourth day, I had found a sublet for a month. Stayed at the sublet for a month. I found the apartment that I'm staying at now. Is that a challenge? I guess, but I decided that I was going to make it happen however it needed to happen. And I, it, it, you know, it's just you do what you got to do. You know what I mean? No, that was, that was a, <laughs> in, in my imagination, yeah. that's a serious challenge, you know. Uh, but, but I think there's some other things you just not like just the, the trying to relocating to from one city to the next. Mm -hmm. 
is very difficult when you are a entrepreneur. You know what I mean? So like, it's not like you transfer from one office to the next office. You start work on Monday. You good? No. In this industry, you gotta get to the new city and build on the connections that you already have. Mm-hmm. No matter if that's fifty people or if it's one person. You know what I mean? Like people don't call you because you can because you got a degree in music. They don't care. Exactly. And I agree with that, but it's no different. And I had to come to a place where, you know, also I'm looking back. So we're looking retrospectively and I'm in the place that I am now, like and everything's cool. Um, but it's no different. And, and somebody told me this. Um, I think it was I think I was having a discussion with Heidi Martin and there's a drummer. I can't remember his name. Um and we were talking about relocating to New York. And <clears throat> what was said to me is, Henry, if you can do it in Atlanta, you can do it in New York. If you can do it, do it in New York, you can do it anywhere. So there's a set of skills that you learn about when you're learning to be an entrepreneur. And they transfer with you wherever you go. You don't unlearn how to make connections and get gigs just because right. you moved from one city to another one. Right, right. Now, do you have enough resources to hold you over? You know, that becomes an issue. Right. But, you know, you also learn at some point. Um, and I had a good growing up, man. I come from, from good stock, from a good family. My parents, you know, made sure that they put in a lot of hard work so that my sister and I would not want for anything. So my experience is not one of coming from the hood or wondering where my next meal would come from. Mm-hmm. However, it was important to me to go away to college, to experience being on my own and to not have as easy access to my parents' resources. So there were times where the lights got cut off when I was in Atlanta because I did or didn't do something that I needed to do. Right, right, right. And while I could have called my parents you know, for help, I chose not to and figured it out myself. Maybe I went and spent too much money trying to impress a woman on a date or you know, bought some shoes or a, a jersey I didn't need. And then didn't have the money. Maybe a gig fell through. You know, maybe I, I was not budgeting on the way that I needed to budget, um, and didn't have the money for the bills later. Right, you know right, what I mean? Right, right. Uh, and so I've learned, and that's a lesson that I was kind of intent on teaching myself because it's not something I had to deal with at home. Uh, thankfully, you know, I'm blessed mm-hmm. to, to have not had to do that. Uh, so it's something that I carried with me. You know, when I got to New York, okay, Henry, you need to scale back on. Your lifestyle decisions. Maybe you don't get, you know, a super nice apartment in Midtown. Maybe you get one that's a little more humble um, so that you can save your money because you are an entrepreneur and you will need your resources at some point. Uh, Let's make sure that we're living beneath our means so that we can make a larger impact. And then, you know, at some point you, you, you enjoy the fruits of the spoil, but until, you know, there's an appointed time for that. Um, and I like you, and still, I'm still in grind mode. Oh yeah, always, still you always you know, in grind. Mode. Still, you know, Diddy <laughs> talks about being in grind mode, and he, yeah. you know, got it. Or yeah. Jay Z, they talk about. I mean, that's a mindset, though, for sure, for sure. Yeah, once you have a success mindset, it's very difficult for you to to rest on your laurels and just be like, "All right, I made it now. I'm gonna chill out," and you know, no, because. Because you you don't you, you don't get any satisfaction from that. You get satisfaction from accomplishing one thing to the next. And that's and that's when you framed your question initially. You know that's kind of what I heard is, well, Henry, what has gotten in the way of your progress? Well, nothing has gotten in well, the way. You know, I don't know if that's stuff, true. Man, Things get in the way of your. your they progress. may slow you down, but they're not gonna stop it. That's that's what I'm. That's they, what, but that's what I'm trying to. And get that's to. <laughs> and that's that's why I was talking about yeah. framing the question differently. Yeah, it's yeah. like okay, well, I'm hearing this. What? Hmm. Yeah, this, well, this well, you is know, a slowdown. It's, it's, but. Well, yeah, it's a slowdown, but it, I think it's important for people to hear, especially young musicians coming mm-hmm. up, to know that life, like my daddy told me, life going to whoop your ass. Mm-hmm. And so the, it's, it's a, you have to ask yourself, am I going to lay down and die or am I going to persevere? You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. things are going to happen. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to, unexpected shit is just going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so you got to make a decision. Okay, this happened. I was going to go right. Now I got to go left. Mm-hmm. I'm still going to get there. But I just got to take this other direction. That's mm-hmm. what I meant by challenges. Yeah. So, so we could clarify that. You know, this ain't TV, bro. 
no. stuff <laughs> not at all stuff happens out here in in the real world you know like you on a gig say you got a really good gig man if it ain't your gig if you don't write the checks right one day that gig is going to end i right. can guarantee you that. right that's just the way it is mm-hmm. so if you're in a situation where you're not preparing for the the eventual end date whether that's you deciding you got a better opportunity or the band leader is hearing something different or you just not you know, you're no longer a fit for the situation. Whatever it may be, mm-hmm. those things happen. But you have to be, you need to be prepared for for challenges like that. Yeah. And also, you need to be, you were prepared to move to another city because when you were in Atlanta, you learned how to make connections in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. You learned these skills. But whereas some some other people who we know didn't, or they didn't have, they came straight from college to New York, and that's a whole other thing mm-hmm. with without experience. So that's that's what I was trying to get. We got it. We got it, man. And that, but that's a you know it's it's I I see them as experiences. What yeah. experiences you know shape where you are now? Mm. Um, yeah, because challenges, man. That's what is that? Mm. You know what I mean? That's okay. All right, cool. This is what we got to do. Let's. I'll, I'll tell you what, though. You know, one thing people don't talk about. What's that? Two things. One is. When you attain uh, success or whatever your definition of success is, what then? Like, how do you how do you handle success in a positive way? Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing is, uh, how do you also handle failure? Because you you can't have one without the other. Well, that's the thing. There is no failure. There are only lessons Mm -hmm. of what not to do. Because there's you know once you've made up in your mind. I am going to do this. That's it. Now, you know, the way I set up my goals is they're specific, but also open ended. You know, what success looks like for me is being able to get up and play music with people that I like to play music with. Mm -hmm. It's for me to have the freedom to make decisions based on what it is that I want to do and not based on something that I have to do. You know what I mean? So you decide, okay, well, I have to do these things in order to get to being able to do this. Right. right. You know, success on a certain level looks like I want to get up and go to Brazil this morning and have the resources to do that. I've not yet reached that level of success, Mm -hmm. but that's what success looks like to me, where I can get up and make a decision and act on it. Right. right. You know what I mean? Um, And now I have enough success to where I can get up and make a decision. And act on it. You know, today I want to go and experience these things um, that are within my reach. And I'm going to go and do that. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, when it comes to success, I think because like I remember, for instance, like when I was, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago Mm -hmm. playing music. And there were certain places that I wanted to play, you know, like let's just say Smalls or some major festival like Montreux or some Mm -hmm. shit like that. And then once you get to play these places, you're just like, oh. This is it. You, sometimes in your mind, you're like the 55 bars. Like you're in, in college, you're looking at it on the internet. It's this thing, and then you get there and play there, and then you accomplish it, and you're just like, oh shit, wait. I, my goals aren't quite big enough. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, so sometimes you achieve success, and you're just like, wait, I was dreaming too small. Or, mm-hmm. And so I just like to talk about those types of things with artists. So, like the people and the young people who are aspiring to be you can know that. You know, it's okay to dream bigger. Oh, yeah. Just like you change, your goals need to change. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was having that very same discussion with my drum teacher. And, you know, well, Henry, what are you dreaming of? I live my dreams. What do you mean? When <laughs> I play the drums and travel. Like, that's what I do. Right, right. You right. know, uh, but there are bigger things there. How can you affect how can I be like Darian how can I you know have a foundation and a program that teaches young people Mm -hmm. you know how can I make that something um you know how can I give back to this other community how can I create say for instance um I'm passionate about fashion Mm -hmm. you know so how can I share my love of fashion with people who don't have the means to deal with that you know how can I teach young people how to shop and you know how to go to the thrift store and get a tailor and you know a right, 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 little right. fun fact the suit i wore to to the album release uh concert that it we was had a bad suit, bro. 
I appreciate you, man. <laughs> I appreciate you. Yeah, sixty three dollars at the at the thrift shop, man. Wow, it's a fifteen hundred dollar wow. suit. Wow, you so, know, yeah. but it's you know I could spend fifteen hundred on a suit, or I could spend fifteen hundred investing. Right, right. Um, you know, what do you want to do with that? You know, it's, mm-hmm. I kind of have enough to do that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If I want to splurge one day, but that's not the 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 wisest thing to do. You know what I mean? What? How can we we be wise about the decisions that we make? Right, right. Uh, and how can we teach other people about you know mm-hmm. the lessons that we've learned? Um, so yeah, man, he's like that's my drum teacher said, dream bigger. That's a that's it. That's yeah, and dreams need to change because you reach your dreams. That's the whole point of that's, having them is you you dream it, you re- you wake up, go get it, and then you dream something else. That is. Yeah, man. So, you know, keep living, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process, man. It's a cycle. Now, you mentioned earlier that with Pride for Dignity, your, your brand new record, um, you told us the, the long-winded explanation of what that means. <laughs> and in, in and I, I'm assuming you said that it it's kind of going again, talking about the kind of some of the things that are happening in, in, uh, socially in America and politically. And, like, are there any specific songs on the record that deal with, like, maybe the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement or something like that? I don't think that any specific titles um, particularly speak to to any specific issue. It's more of a it's more of a thing where the songs kind of put you in a frame of mind of this that's going on. Uh, The rape. Brown composition that opens uh, the record is called Slippery. It's a song that was written about club owners who, you know, are less than less than cool sometimes. Um, so it's it's little things when you deal with the with Pride for Dignity cut on the record that was composed by Kenny Banks Jr., our pianist. You hear a landscape of sounds and emotions that walk you through that experience of what it is or you deal with uh, the Marcus print-up composition hopscotch you know it puts you in a frame of mind of the experience of you know little girls at church jumping rope and you know outside scuffing up their their patent leather shoes and you know you kind of hear the mama in the background and or maybe you think about the four little girls in Birmingham Mm -hmm. you know and that's what they might have been doing that day. Okay, so um, it's more of like an overall view of it's a larger of, picture of Black American, African American culture. It's a larger picture. It's a larger picture. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because you know, I, I, which is that's dope, and we need that. You know, we need more. Uh, we need representation. Mm-hmm. You know, that matters. Um, today, it seems like a, a, a few artists in our community are also making like direct statements mm-hmm. on the things that are happening in. How do you feel about that? Do you think that's the wrong way to go? And why did you choose to go your route versus that route? I mean, I think that's the the role of the artist is to reflect the times. Yeah. You have to. Um, I am a more subtle kind of player. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm more. How can I say more with less words? Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about our brother, dear brother, Corey Wallace. Yeah, he's yeah. he's going to talk <laughs> ad nauseum. Yeah. about what's passionate about him or he's going to write a lengthy Facebook post about it. It's just my personality to address the same issues differently. I may choose two words in a strong in a strong photograph to say the exact same thing he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think art is about having conversation and discussion. So it's my role we, when we talk about releasing the record that we just that we just released. We released it on a Tuesday because you remember a time where records came out on Tuesday. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, in our physical copies of the record, there are liner notes. There's an experience to be had with the actual physical record mm-hmm. itself. Um, when I was in college, I played in a band called Jazz Specs, and we would get together and we would listen to records or albums. They were CDs. Mm-hmm. And we would look at the not liner notes. We would read them. We would see who's doing what, who's playing on this song, what are these words talking about, what does this mean? And it's about a community which we've kind of lost. So our decision to present our music in this way hopefully will bring a bit of culture back and a bit of experience that 
um, that we've been doing differently in the way that we consume music. Yeah. Um, you know, when I share it with people, I ask them to listen and then let's talk. You know, I want to know what spirit or what emotions were evoked when you listened. Mm. When you took just the information that we shared with you, which is, you know, liner notes, song titles, photographs. Then you put that together with the the music that you experienced. Now what? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a deeper experience, I think. Um, I remember presenting with Pride for Dignity in Atlanta. uh, One of the first times we played it before we recorded it. And we played it to an audience at the High Museum of Art um, during their Friday Night Jazz uh, series. And we played the song, and I did not announce it prior to us playing it. But I asked the people if they could hear, you know, the slave running off the plantation or if they could hear the 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 whip cracking or the elements that are familiar, you know, to those who listen to it. You know, the, the, you know what those sounds are like. It's right. it's something that we study um, as as musicians. What does this feeling sound like? Mm. What does this experience sound like? And, and listeners know it. Because they hear it when they watch movies. Yeah, you're cued to be afraid in a horror music, a horror movie, not because of what you see, because of what you hear, because of what you hear. Right, right, right. You know, you know right. when the 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 hero gets the villain because of what you hear. You might see it, but there's a feeling that you get that's created by the music. Right. Okay. I, look, I agree with that. <laughs> I, you know, and there is no wrong way. I mean, th- there's, there's just, no wrong. There way, is right. no wrong way. But I think that your way. Uh, is very effective. It can be very effective. And uh, the way that you guys present your music, it is definitely effective. You know what I mean? Um, I think I am more of like a bash you over the head type uh-huh. person, but that's cool. And that's, <laughs> but but we need that. That's yeah. balance. Right. Right. You exactly. know, we can't have a bunch of people like you. There'll be nobody <laughs> just so up the heads. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's true. It's just, oh, well, it's just everybody got hit over the head. Now what right. do we do? Right. Man, I, I want to stay on, kind of in, in this groove, and okay? Because we, we in in our industry right now, we do have some challenges, mm-hmm. you know. And one of our biggest challenges is the sexism that happens mm-hmm. towards women. Um, and I think it's our responsibility as men, and especially as black men, to hit some of these topics head on mm-hmm. and talk about them frankly and bluntly. So, how can we? What can we do, just as one person, to stop? the madness when it comes to people disrespecting women and especially disrespecting our women in any place in this country, but especially uh, on the bandstand or off of it in our community. You got to call it out. If you see it, you got to call it out. Um, And again, there are different ways to call it out. Uh, You may bash a cat over the head or, you know, you may stop what's going on in a moment and speak directly to what happens. Um, It would be more my nature to bring a cat to the side and say, hey, man, you can't do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not cool. It's not, you know. Mm-hmm. But you've got, if you see it, you got to you have to say something. Right. And have you been in a situation where you've had to intervene or make some corrections due to some uh, people stepping out, out of what you perceive? Not on the bandstand, uh-huh. um, thankfully. Yeah. That's not something that I've had to do on the bandstand with my peers. I'm thinking now back to um, a situation where I was on stage and saw something happen um, and the music stopped. And I don't know who said it, but a decision was made that we were not going to resume our performance until the person who had um, what's the word I'm looking for? The person who had offended mm-hmm. um, one of our sisters, mm-hmm. you know, was put out of the club. You know, I, I feel like I said it. I don't. Rem- I don't want to misremember. Right, right. But I feel like I said we're not playing until he's gone. Yeah. Um, get this man out of the club. He he physically accosted. Um, yeah. Somebody who you and I both know, and I'm oh, not going to say who it was right, or right, where right. it was. Just. Right. For her privacy, and that's yeah. another thing, man. You've got it's a, it's such such a sensitive issue, yeah. um, that you you, yeah, you, you you've got to be aware of it. And you know, I travel a lot with 
with uh, with women, band leaders, artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm vigilant about it. You know, and I'm always watching and doing my best to stop stuff before it has an opportunity to start. Right. I know I was in Italy once and a young uh, a patron asked if they could have an autograph and he wanted a kiss mm-hmm. with the autograph. And I'm like, hey, man, I don't think that's a good idea. Right. Uh, and he went on to ask the artist, well, can I have a kiss? And she shut it down. No, of course <laughs> I mean, she did. <laughs> you know, she, but it's like, hey, you know, I tried to stop this before. Before like, we got there, right. Let's, yeah. let's, hey, man, that's not, right. that's not cool at all. But people. Right. See, men, men need to, to remember that they're not entitled. Not at all. You're not entitled to any, you're not even entitled to a fucking autograph. So, you know, that's a, pre, that's a gift in itself. So I don't even, never touch someone ever. Mm-hmm. And, and but they, they try it. They, people people try it. Yeah. yeah. But not thankfully I have not dealt with any colleagues who have done any crazy stuff. Yeah. We coming to an end, man. I got a few more questions, but you know, All right, just, that's cool. I know I'm wearing you out. No, I'm good, okay, man. Okay, cool. I got another four fourteen hours left, man. Okay. <laughs> Let's go, bro. How long are these things? <laughs> <laughs> man, in, in our community we do have this what I like to call the starving artist myth. Mm-hmm. Where uh artists not just musicians tell themselves this story of uh, they should they can starve in order to achieve their goal of creating art for a living right and frankly i think that's some bullshit Mm -hmm. (laughs) i agree (laughs) you ain't gotta be broke to make art Mm -mm. and and most of the people that i admire were not in fact broke Mm -mm. and so what what do you think we can do to change this idea? Because I, I think it's perpetuated in universities. You know, at least from the university I went to, I'm sh- like I, a few people told me it was like you can't make a living playing jazz drums. <laughs> I have been told that by some people. Mm-hmm. Um, my experience. I didn't go to a university. I went to a, a college. Um, and it was not a music conservatory type of college. Yeah, mine so, either. I studied marketing. So, you know. Oh yeah. So I don't. Yeah. So no. No one. No one at my college told me that. But then I, you know, was very careful in in making sure that I went to a place that they would up, uplift me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so glad I went to Morehouse for a million reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First and foremost, because Spelman's right next door. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, no. Seriously, though, no, man, it's a community. Um, where the faculty and the students are about um, uplifting each other. just So I did not hear that at all. So I don't know what people are saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have heard it. It's oxymoronic because they know that Beyonce has money and Jay-Z has money and... Uh, Rihanna, whoever else you want to name, Cardi B even, you know, has money. So it's like, you don't think that artists are broke? And I hope you don't think that the people that play with them are broke. Right. Because they're not. Mm-hmm. You know, are they getting paid the best? That's a whole other conversation. Um, I think what you specifically can do, Darian, it's just wear Gucci from head to toe all day, every <laughs> Absolutely day. Absolutely not. That's just mad. That's what. <laughs> right. No, no. I, I think. I think what we have to do is carry ourselves in a way that shows people that we're not broke, and that's not necessarily being, um, being flamboyant. But if you carry yourself in a way that says, "Okay, I'm okay," um, for me. It was making the decision to finance my own project. Mm -hmm. It was not asking people for money for my art, not to create my art. Now, when you're ready to consume it, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think that the crowdfunding route is a great route and it's been proven to do this and what you're doing is... um, Selling, selling it experience that people are able to get on board with. And I think that that's great. But Lamborghini didn't ask for no startup money. Well. Not like, not in that way. 
they didn't have that option. We disagree on this, but you know, I think crowdfunding can be a source, uh, a source for some for to to. Fund I'm not some saying it's projects. bad. Now, I think you get in trouble when you try to crowdfund every project. Then I think that's just a bad business move, and I I would wouldn't keep crowdfunding. But that's stuff. that's that's part of my point mm-hmm. is that when you're asking people for money to produce a project, then what? financial responsibility have you taken on yourself right, right, right. and especially when you do it a second third fourth fifth time what have you done with the money that we invested the first time now that's the question i ask myself like i don't like even two times i just don't want to do it every year for you like that but i think crowdfunding is is a good way to do some projects you know i right? don't disagree I don't disagree. Some projects, yeah, some projects, but I don't. But, it, there, there are some things for me for a personal project, or you know, something I'm leading. Like if you're dealing with like a community, say community theater, or you know, something that you don't yourself have ownership of, mm-hmm. then that's you know, and and not saying everybody should necessarily have the means or does have the means. Right. I'm not. I'm not saying it's not for everybody, but in my purview. It is one way to say I'm not starving. I can finance yeah. what's going on. That's true. I, I like I said, I disagree, but I hear you. But also, I think one one thing, one reason, uh, thing that's missing in music education, especially, is uh, personal financial education. Mm-hmm. So one cannot save money for a project because they don't know how to mm-hmm. save money. You see what I'm saying? So the the first step is to figure out a way, especially in our community, to teach people the basics of personal finance. And then after that, more people will be able to fund their own projects like like you have, you know, and like I have. But I've also used crowdfunding. Like for the very first record, we crowdfunded. For the second and third, we didn't. Mm-hmm. Because... But and, and, <laughs> and, and there you have it. Like yeah. there is a, a personal responsibility that you have had, you know, with the records that you've done to say, okay, I've procured this investment. I'm not going to ask you to reinvest Mm. every time I want to do something. Right. Because that doesn't make any sense. Right. You know, you get your principal and you put it towards, you know, what it is that you're doing and then you get the return on that investment and it, you know. Right, for sure. So, and and we don't talk about that. We don't, in music, in, 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 in musical education, I don't often hear the financial component. I don't hear a lot of marketing components or sales components. There's playing. Yeah. And then there's asking people for gigs. Right. But there's not a whole lot of talk about creating your own work. I learned how to create my own work. Yeah. yeah. I learned how to create opportunities um, to make music. Mm-hmm. That's something that I learned how to do during my time in Atlanta. And I think somebody, you know, everybody has to do it. I'm watching people learn how to do it in New York. For sure. You know, I'm talking to my peers and my friends about, you know, hey, man, you have ownership over this creative idea. You are not beholden to this club or that club. You have direct contact with your audience. You can take it wherever they want, exactly. wherever you want to take it and demand that you get paid and compensated fairly for your art. You're absolutely right. You're only limited by your own imagination That's it. and ability to put in the work. That's it. So, you know, but you have to, in, in, in today's age, just going back to the, the financial education, if you want it, you can get it. Mm-hmm. And if you want it and you don't know how to get it, shoot me an email. Mm-hmm. I'll send you everything I know. Shoot Henry an email. He'll send you everything he knows and we'll, we'll support you on that. Yeah, matter. and I appreciate you, Darian, for keeping that communication open about your financial literacy. And I'm, I'm impressed about what you the knowledge that you continuously seek as yeah. far as that's concerned. Bro, I appreciate that. I just yeah, want to share it with the world. Yeah, bro. man, I'm going to just give you some money and let you invest it, bro. I just, you know. Nah, bro, don't tell me. I'm going to put it in my account. <laughs> All right, man, we're coming to an end. So I ask everybody that comes on the show this question. What are you most thankful for? Family, hands down. Um, hands down, man. I'm thankful for um, the family that I was born into. I'm, I'm, I don't take for granted that I have a good relationship with the people that I'm related to. Not everybody does. And I'm thankful for chosen family, uh, for my chosen family in Atlanta, my mm-hmm. chosen family in New York, mm-hmm. and people that you know I've met 
along the way anywhere in the world. You know, I've got friends that I can call on almost every place I go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and people that will say, oh, hey, Henry's in town, man. You need a place to stay. You need a meal. You know, come meet my baby or, right, you know, right. talk to talk to whoever. Uh, I'm grateful for that, man. There's so much more to life than music. Music is important. And it's great. But, man, family, like you, nothing without family, man. Nothing. 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 That's true. I'm Family like over over everything. <laughs> For real. 100% I'm with that. Yeah, man. You included, man. Oh, Family man. over everything. You already know. Yeah. Man. You already know. Yeah, man. Before we go, I want to give you an opportunity to um, plug any of your projects you got coming up, your website, anything you want the people to know about. Ah, oh, man. Just stay connected. T-H-E-H-C-3.com. We keep the website updated um, with tour dates and shows. But... I'd like for everybody that's listening um, to give our music a listen, you know, and let me know how you th- how you feel about it. Let me know what it makes you think about what you know. Especially having heard this uh, podcast, I'm really curious to know um, what resonates and why. And you can find that at for sure uh, Apple Music. Yeah, you can find it. Spotify, it's, it's everywhere. Yep. Amazon, and if you want a good old physical copy, you can get it from your website. Yep. So go to go to Henry's website. I'll link all this this stuff in the description of the podcast. And uh, yeah, y'all check it out. So Henry, man, thanks for coming on the Working Artist Project. Thanks for having me, bro. If you like what you heard, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. And also don't forget to leave us a review. The Working Artist Project is brought to you by Second Line Arts Collective. I'm Darian Douglas, and this is The Working Artist Project.